Okay, this is the Brian Hornback Experience. This is episode 87, and we have another candidate who's on the ballot August the 4th. Uh, early voting is July 15th through the 30th, and we have Jackson Finner, a candidate for uh, District Attorney General, and um, I'll give all his, I'll give all his website addresses: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, well, you can go to his website right now. It's vote v o t e Jackson J a c k s o n Finner f e n n e r dot com. But we'll give all that when we get toward the end. Uh, Mr. Finner, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Appreciate you being on. So just just to kind of acquaint people with you a little bit, okay. um, are you are you from Knoxville originally? I'm originally from Western New York. Buffalo, oh, okay. Buffalo area, but I've been here since the '90s. Okay. Five years at least. I came down here as a young man in my early 20s, and I've been here ever since. Wow. And so you graduated uh, with a political science degree from the University of Tennessee, correct? That's right. And then uh, you got a, uh, then you got your, um, uh, you got your uh, law, degree. Law, law degree from UT as well. And so I you, two from UT. yeah. Yep. So you've been you've been practicing law here in Knoxville for a, for a little bit, uh, at least. About Eleven years. Right. Right. Uh, let's talk about now a couple of things that you've gotten. Uh, in 2014, you got the Attorney for Justice Award from the Supreme Court. Kind of talk about. Before we really get into a whole lot, uh, go ahead and uh, talk about that award and and uh, what what the Tennessee Supreme Court were recognizing you for on that award. Well, I appreciate you doing your homework. Right? Well, I I, I got to try to, you know. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. So the the, the Attorney for Justice Award is is given to attorneys um, who uh, for public service. It's okay. A, it's an award for for pro bono activity, um, and most of that work was done. Um, helping domestic violence victims get orders of protection. Um, I did a few cases where I helped people with some credit card debt. Mm. Um, you know, just kind of giving advice. Should I file bankruptcy? How do I handle this? Those types of things. Um, you know, I participate in, um, you know, the, the legal aid has their uh, Saturday bar where they have lawyers come in on Saturdays and just talk with the public and give legal advice, doing, doing that type of stuff too. And so I assume that's kind of what this, the, uh, when the Knoxville Bar recognized you on the pro bono project, I'm I'm assuming that was that was yeah, the same type of stuff. Right, yeah. right, right. So, uh, so now, first of all, you are you are a you're a, a father and a husband. Uh, right. So, uh, talk about that for a little bit. How you? you uh, my my wife Amy. We've been married for eight years. We just had our anniversary. She's a business owner. She she owns and operates a salon in South Knoxville. She's a hairdresser. Right. I got three kids. Um, you know, wide variety of wow. 20, 21, 14, and 5. Wow. Wow. So the oldest is a Powell High graduate. Got one in Powell High now. And then uh, the youngest is at First Lutheran. Okay. So so do y'all live in the Powell community? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool, yeah. cool, cool. All right. Well, uh, so you, you've done, a, you've done a, sounds like you've done quite a bit of domestic violence kind of defense work. Uh, what, um, what may, now you're, you're not, you're not a rookie to politics. You, you ran a couple of years ago, I think as an independent for, uh, for law director. How was, how was that experience? Well, it was, um, it, it was, you know, I hate to say it, but it was fun. Okay. You know, people always say how stressful it is to run and it is stressful, but I, I, you know, I enjoyed getting out there and talking to people and, you know, it was the middle of the pandemic. So, you mm. know, the, 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 the story is kissing babies in a pandemic. Oh, that, that that's true. That was in 2020. That's right. Yeah, so this is pre-vaccine 2020. So was, there wasn't a lot of door knocking, but I would go to, I'd still go to the neighborhood meetings, you know, as much as I could. And, uh, you know, it was, I, I really enjoyed getting in front of people and talking to people and then just seeing what their concerns were. And, um, you know, I, I have my own practice. So for me, the stakes I hate to say they're not high, but I don't need the job. Right. I'd like to serve my community. I'd love to do the job and help people out and, and, and you know, give back a little bit. But I didn't, I didn't feel pressure, you know, mm. to win. So right. I think, and I kind of, yeah, that's just having that kind of attitude where um, there's a, I kept the positive, you know, right. it wasn't something 
Because because at that point you were up against uh, so so you're a you're a solo practice attorney is what right. okay uh, and so you were up against at that time you were up against the uh, the chief deputy senior chief deputy whatever so I mean it, right so it was it was it was his job right so I mean if if uh, He's already in the right right so He's I mean minted, so yeah. so I mean if he lost. If he lost, it was it, that was his salary. That was, I mean, you know, he's gonna have to go. He's gonna have to go back to private practice, which. Uh, so yeah, so you know, you didn't have you didn't have near the stress. Uh, so did you? Uh, was it during that process that you uh, decided in this race you're running as a Democrat? Uh, is it is it during that independent run that you decided that you wanted to to uh, identify with one party or the other? I mean, was that a was, and I've always considered myself a moderate. Okay. You know, definitely, you know, I feel more at home with, with the Democrat Party. And it was Matt Shears that reached out to me, you know, the chair. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had lunch. And, uh, you know, he basically made me think it was my idea. But they, they, he kind of recruited me. I'll give him credit for that. He's done a lot of good work over there. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, you know, this – I uh, – realize that if I want to get there, I need help. Right. You know, we, we can't, no one can do everything. I can't do everything on my own. Right. You know, so running as independent, I realized there were so many opportunities I was missing because I didn't have anybody on the team. I couldn't be everywhere at once. Um, and, you know, the, the, the party has allowed me to basically build my own platform and um, can't kind of uh, run on the issues I want to run on. So it's been, they've been great that way. They've well, and I'm a, I'm a former party chairman back in 2005, 2007, obviously with the Republican Party. But I mean, you know, people have asked me about Matt Shears, and I said, hey, you know, if if I were if I were the minority um, party chairman, I'd be doing the same thing Matt's doing. I mean, I I would be I would be trying to find candidates to run. Um, right. You know, yeah. so you know. But now going to your website, votejacksonfenner dot com, um, you got a few things on there about why you're running. Uh, one of them. One of them, you talk about the murder rates at an all-time high, and yeah. police officers are getting away with homicide. I, I assume you're talking about the incident at Austin East High School with Anthony Thompson Jr. Well, there's also the incident where there was uh, an officer, like uh, T-Bone, somebody, right oh. in the middle of the night. Right. And I'm not saying that these well, and, 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 and I'm, I'm right. saying that there should be. I, I feel like the investigations were too open and shut. And I feel like maybe they got a pass because they're police officers. But, you know, I, I was endorsed by the Paternal Order of Police when I ran for, for law director. Oh, wow. I, I miss that. I pretend to know how to do their job because I don't. But, you know, I feel like we should hold officers to a higher standard. They took an oath. And, you know, if, if they're guilty of a crime, then I think that we need to, to look into it. And I just feel that, uh, that you know, if it would have been you or me, running dark and we keep on somebody, I think that we would be in front of a grand jury. Right, right. And and now she has, I guess there is a recent case where a guy did a, um, where a KPD officer was running. Um, he turned off his cam, uh, he turned off his cruiser cam. But anyway, there, so she does have, she does, uh, the incumbent uh, does have one that she's uh, recently uh, brought charges on uh, for. <laughs> For, for that right, chase. That was after multiple incidents. They finally got him on one of them. Oh, okay. But, you know, yeah. And then, and now you talk about the over, the, the other, uh, the second issue you talk about in your websites, the overdose deaths. Uh, and obviously that, that, you know, that, I think that's a problem, uh, not only in our community, but everywhere. Um, yeah. and so, you know, you, when you're the district attorney, um, what kind of solution, um, um, how how will you how will you how will you handle um, the um, the addiction with felonies and, and petty theft? How how will that be different with Jackson Fenner as district attorney? Well, what you're referring to is you know Charm Allen had basically had been creating felonies out of misdemeanor shoplifting. What I mean by that is a person will go into Walmart or something and they'll get caught shoplifting. A misdemeanor offense, they'll be on the no trespass list, and then if they go back and steal mm. a pair of socks, then they're charged with felony burglary, which is a class D felony. Mm. Um, so the law does not require her to do that, but she took it all the way to the Supreme Court and they said, you, 
can do that. The way the law is written, it's permissible to do that. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're taking persons who are suffering from drug addiction. Um, they need help. And yes, they're guilty of misdemeanor shoplifting in a lot of these cases. And I'm not saying we should let them go. They should still be prosecuted. But we need to think about the, you know, the long term. If we, if we take a person who suffers from addiction and now we brand them with a felony, that person has nowhere to go. Where are they going to live? How are they going to get a job? How are we going to help that person turn it around? Right. Because now they have this felony on their record that's never going to go away. They can't get it off their record. So they're stuck. So that, what chance do we have of, ha- of getting that person off of the substance they're addicted to mm. if there's nowhere for them to go? So there has to be, I think that if we can just find a way to punish the person, because yeah, there's all these, you know, you hear all these horror stories about people walking out of Home Depot or shopping carts full of stuff and not getting caught, people in L.A. getting away with shoplifting. That's not what I'm talking about. Right. If you're guilty of shoplifting, you're guilty of shoplifting, and you can do up to a year in jail for doing that. But I'm thinking about the long-term effect that it has on this person who's addicted to drugs. So that's it. So, you know, so, so if somebody gets caught. That's the first step. That's the day right. one thing that I can do. No more retail burglaries that, that occur during times when the store is open mm. we don't have to do that we went years and years and years decades without doing that and then as recently maybe four or five years ago they started this process and we were the and we were the petri dish no other counties are doing it once the Tennessee Supreme Court said you could do it it started to catch on in other counties and so and so I, so if I'm understanding of course I'm not an attorney but so basically that is that another situation where if you get caught um if you get caught uh, shoplifting at Walmart X Y Z, and then they 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 put that they put that charge on you that if you go back, you're is that a criminal trespassing? Is that is that is that what so, that felony is? So what happens is, so here's how it works. You if you, if you go to Walmart to caught shoplifting, it's first offense, right? right Walmart right. will put you on their no trespass list. Okay. The Brian Horback is no longer allowed in Walmart. So if you go back into Walmart and get caught shoplifting. Then they will say, well, the burglary statute says if you enter into a, an establishment without consent, with intent to commit a theft, I'm paraphrasing the statute, right. then that, you're guilty of burglary. So mm. the argument that they're making is that, well, they don't have consent to be in there. So it's no different than breaking in after the store is closed because they're not allowed to be there. Okay. But if the person goes in there and doesn't steal something, they don't kick them out. They'll right. let you make the purchase. Right. So... So the, the question is, what does it mean to have consent to be in an open public place that's open? Hmm. You know, because and it's 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 a very clever argument, but I think that it's almost cruel in a way, because what you're doing is you're taking a person and bringing them with a felony when they're guilty of shoplifting. And we had a second event shoplifting a statute in in Tennessee. It's still a misdemeanor. We can still make the person go to jail. We can still make them pay restitution. We don't need to make them into a felon, and I don't see any reason for that. So, and all you're doing is you're 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 like I said, you're making it more difficult for this person to turn it around. And that's something that we can do that won't cost a nickel, right? You know, so and and, and the, the the amount of money that it takes to try these cases is thousands of dollars to have a trial because a lot of the lawyers, myself included, are saying if if these guys if you're sticking with a felony, we're just going to go to trial. And we're trying them, um, you know, with mixed results. I actually was able to beat one, but most most of them have been get convictions because there's nothing to lose at that point. Mm. So, you know, and how much does it cost to panel a jury? How much does it cost to feed the jury? How much does it cost? It's thousands and thousands of dollars right. that we're wasting to make the drug problem worse. Mm. So, you know, I think that if we can afford to try them, maybe we can afford to maybe treat them. So there, I think that the funding is there. There's, there are ways to do this that will be a minimal minimal expense um, right on the front end. And it, it's, I, I'm not saying it'll make a huge impact, but you know, it, it seems like it's going to make some impact. Right. Well, I, and I appreciate you explaining that because I didn't, I didn't truly understand uh, that, that, that process or how that's being interpreted. Uh, now, you know, you also talk about on your website about persons dying in police custody. I think we've had several incidences in um in knox County. well knox county um we had one where um after a high-speed chase they um 
they uh, hog tied a guy and left him on his uh, left him on his um, chest and uh, yeah. he, he suffocated. And I think I think the county wound up having to pay almost three quarter or paid three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, that may be one of the situations you're you're referring to, but that's one of them. There's one where someone died right at the DF, right at the detention facility, right in the back of the van. That was oh, that's right. Ago. Yeah, I mean, it just happened. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's is that negligent homicide? I don't know, but you know, it's happening, and there has to be a way to to hold some people accountable. You know, this I don't see any accountability for that. I mean, we, yeah, we pay money. But does that act as a deterrent? Does that solve the problem? I don't. I don't think so. Right. So uh, obviously, you've done a, you've done quite a bit of defense work. Um, you've done um, uh, you know some some uh, practice. Have you have you been have, have you been a prosecutor? Have you been on the other side of of the of the bar um, uh, helping to deal with with those issues? I've not worked as a prosecutor in okay. the prosecutor's office, right. but I have prosecuted. Um, contempt cases, you know, um, and, and divorce issue, and, and, and post-divorce and divorce and order protection, okay, and, and child support. So I've, I have prosecuted offenses, but I've not worked within a prosecutor's office. Right, right. Okay. Um, I guess the last thing you have on your website is um, uh, the uh, the statement about the current DA's beholden to big interest, uh, big business interest, and not interest in equal treatment under the law. Is there is there a specific case, or is there something that will be different under a Jackson Fenner as district attorney there? Well, really, with, with that, what that goes back to is this whole, like I was talking about the the burglary for shoplifting. Okay. Because who does that help? That right. helps Walmart. That okay. That helps Kroger. That helps Target. Right. So, and I know that these issues are not like they're not like you know bullet point talking right. points. Right. No, they're not. Um, but 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 these are the issues that have motivated me to run that, you know, it's, 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 it, it's really frustrating and infuriating that, you know, basically we have, we're, we're, we're helping out Walmart, but we're not helping out the people who are, who are suffering from addiction. Right. Right. And then, and then she'll go and brag about how she, uh, how she convicted some big drug kingpin and came down from Detroit all the while, in my opinion, um, expanding the market for, drug traffickers mm. right well what else um, how how are how is the perception as you've been out campaigning um i know we're, we're real early in the process um we're now uh, at the end of may there's um we have a whole nother month the month of june and then we have a couple of weeks in july before early boat starts and then uh so we're we're about two months out from august 4th so yeah. how has how has the campaign been going how um how do you feel the? Um, how do you feel your your um, your message is going, and um, anything else you'd like to share with us? I've, I've been getting good response from the messages. You know, I, I've been I've been talking to a lot of folks and, and hear a lot of concerns, and um, you know, I think it's going very well. Um, I've got a lot of people who you know told me they've been Republicans their whole life, but they're you know they're going to support me. And, mm. You know, I've been getting bipartisan support, um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not like, you know, burn it all down, defund everything, kind of Democrat. You okay. Know, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to bring sensible solutions, and uh, I think people are responding to that. Well, I do think, I do think that's, I do think that's important. I, I think that's one thing we heard in, in uh, particularly in the sheriff's uh, primary, uh, is that you know you had, um, you had two candidates. Obviously the it was a lopsided. It was a lopsided victory for the for the winner of that primary. But yeah. obviously, there was some discussion, and there's continued discussion in the community about defund the police. I mean, the 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 district attorney has to work with the police once. That's right. Once once the police have have, com, have completed an investigation, they turn it over to the district attorney, and then the district attorney has to decide if if it need if, if it can go across the in a football term across the across the end zone uh, to get right. a prosecution. So, I mean, obviously the, the district attorney has to work with the police. So you feel- I also, you, yeah, I also have to have police officers as witnesses on the stand to make the case. I'm right. aware of that. Right. So, it, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't have an anti-police 
stand, you know, stance at all. Okay. You know, I respect the police, and you know, most of them do a good job. But if you are committing a criminal offense, or if I think you are quote unquote bad apple, then you got to go. And mm. that's what I told the Return Order Police when they endorsed me last time. Is you know, I'll support you guys, I'll help you guys, but I'm, I'm not going to circle the wagons around somebody who I think is engaged in criminal activity. It's not going to happen. So, so you feel like you feel like you'll be able to have a a, a good open relationship with uh, the sheriff and the and the police chief to be able to to help them determine who who might it, once in a, a bad apple's determined. You feel like you can work with uh, Sheriff Spangler and then our our new police chief to help transition uh, to, to help I identify do. those. Okay, absolutely, I do. Yeah, I look forward to to, to working with them and uh, you know doing what we have to do. You know, my focus is going to be, you know, on is is not going to be on making small crimes into big crimes. You know, I want to focus on the violent crimes, the violence. Mm. That's really what my my whole end game is. You know, it's it's not about it's not about turning petty offenses into felonies. I want to prosecute the real felonies, mm. the murders. I mean, it's it's out of control. I've been here for twenty five years, and uh, you know. It's scary out there, right? In a lot of places. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think we. I mean, obviously, we. Obviously, I, I suspect we. I mean, you know, I'm in. I'm in Southwest Knox County, so I, you know, I'm not. I'm not in the. I mean, crimes everywhere. Uh, I mean, we. You know, but I mean, uh, I, I do think we have some. We have some issues, obviously, that have come to light with, with uh, not just Anthony Thompson Jr., but several incidents that happened around Austin East last year, and and. Um, I mean, obviously, we got we got something going on. So, I, I think part of the problem is just um, you know just a, a, a natural side effect to the population explosion that we've had. Mm. You know, when you have more people, you're going to have exponential crime growth. I think that that's you know that's not uh, you know, that's, that's not unreasonable to, to make that conclusion. But the, the, the question is, how do you handle? It? Right. You know, and I don't know if it's been handled properly. Right. Well, uh, folks can find you, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, folks can find you on the on the Internet at Vote Jackson Fenner, V-O-T-E, Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N-F-E-N-N-E-R.com. Uh, both on Facebook and Instagram, it's the same, Vote Jackson Fenner. And then on, right. tw on Twitter, because Twitter limits us to our number of, uh, our number of letters, it's just Vote Fenner. Uh, on right. Twitter, so um, hopefully po uh, people will will get out there uh, and uh, look you up, and um, and uh, you know we uh, we wish you well in the uh, upcoming general election. Again, that's August the fourth, early votes July fifteenth through the thirtieth. Uh, and any last remaining uh, things you want to say before before I let you get back to your family and and well, your life? Well, just uh, you know, just uh, my message always is just to get out and vote. It's right. crucial we get out and vote. And uh, I hope everybody turns out. And, uh, you know, see you all August 4th. Sounds great. Good luck, and we'll talk to you then. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Bye-bye.